Hello, Facebook. Hello, Internet. Uh, thank you for watching Hutchins Talks. My name is Kate Driscoll. I'm the Public Programs Manager for the Hutchins Center for Art and Learning. And today I get to speak with three extremely talented people. Uh, Laura Adams, the curator of Three Billion, and two of the Three Billion artists, Kate Freaky and Chris Condon. And uh, Laura, I'll let you take it away. Thank you, Kate. Uh, let me first uh, share my screen. Okay. So yes, thank you, Kate, and thank you to the Hutton Center for the Arts, um, and welcome everyone to the Three Billion exhibit. Um, I'm the curator of the show. My name is Laura Adams, and I'm going to be taking you through an overview of the show, um, and then we're going to be talking to um, two of the artists, uh, Kate Breakey and Chris Condon, and I'll introduce them in more detail later. I'll go over some of their work um, in the meantime, but wanted to let you know what the setup was for today. So the Three Billion Show is, it's an art show. Um, in the name Three Billion is a reference to a study that was published in the fall of 2019 in Science Magazine, which found that in the last 50 years, North America has lost a third of its bird population, which amounts to some three billion birds. Now, these losses are shocking, not just because of their numbers, but because their losses over many different biomes of bird species. We've lost over a third of our forest birds. We've lost over 50% of our grassland birds. And we've lost over 30% of birds like aerial insectivores. And there are many other different biomes that are also in decline in North America. And the primary causes for these losses are human activity. Habitat loss is one of the big factors. Window collisions, plastic pollution, overuse of pesticides are some of the other large factors. Now, if you're in the birding community, which I am, this was front page news. Every birder in North America knew about this problem in late 2019, but I have found that if you're outside of the birding community, very few people have heard about this. We've been preoccupied with a few other things. And it was around the same period of time that the Hudson Center asked me to curate a show. So I'm an artist as well as the curator of the show, and I wanted to put together an exhibit about something that I was passionate about. I'm an avid birder and hiker and a long-term member of the Georgia Audubon Society, which is co-sponsor of the show. And I've created art in the environmental space for the past 25 years. And I found that art communicates in a different way than the spoken word. It can reach emotions and speak to people in ways that perhaps a scientist or an advocate cannot. People often tell me about messages and meanings present in my own work that I was not aware of until I looked at the piece myself and said, oh, I must have been communicating that in a different way. And having worked in the environmental art field for some 25 years, I knew a number of other artists who also work in this area and are as passionate about conserving spaces for our wild neighbors as I am. And so I invited a few of these artists uh, to create works for this show with me. So I and my fellow artists hope that this show brings awareness to our plight of our North American birds and offers some solutions and strategies to help fix the problem. So we hope that this art inspires you to join us. So many of you are familiar with the Hudgens Center, but I'm going to bring you into the space room by room to show you um, the exhibit and tell you a little bit more about the work that we have. So the first uh, exhibit that you get to is when you walk into this beautiful atrium area with, uh, with the skylight. And we have a piece in here created by the Museum of Infinite Outcomes, and it's called the Avifana. 
So this is a rotating exhibit of human crafted homes for birds. And in the museum states, we share our lands, skies, seas, and cities with a great diversity of life. And each year, the Museum of Infinite Outcomes puts out a call for bird homes, asking for submissions to be sent to them. The avifauna is a rotating exhibition of spatial compromises that celebrate the times that people lend a hand to the natural world, because living together is a compromise. And as you can see, we have many different interpretations of what a human crafted home for birds is. We have a lot of painted gourds, some home woodworking projects. Some of the pieces were created by children. We had an artist who wanted to think more like a bird, so she wove a bunch of nests herself. And then we have things that are more abstract in nature. As a, a few homes that are repurposed bird homes from craft stores. Many different types of interpretations that are fun to, to see. And I wanted to end on this particular piece because it was created by a Georgia Audubon Society member who was also a fan of the Van Halen rock band. And this is a memorial to the lead guitarist, Eddie Van Halen. So from the, the, the atrium area, you walk into the next room and you're greeted by an octagonal table full of wetlands birds. I'll talk more about it here. This grouping of art is by a local artist. His name is Chris Wilson and on this this octagonal exhibit, Chris put together a bunch of uh, wood sculptures, hand carved wood sculptures that he created that depicted different wetlands birds. And these wetlands birds, um, he wanted to include some of the birds that were doing very well due to legislation surrounding wetlands um, conservation and also to outline a couple of the birds um, that live in the wetlands that actually need more legislative help. And one of the things you really notice about Chris Wilson's work is how incredibly detailed his carvings are. Carvings of wood, he adds metal. There's usually a lot of expression and a couple of surprises with each piece. The green heron piece, for example, has a tiny green tree frog that it's eyeing from above. And the clapper rail that we just passed has some pollution surrounding it, which um, speaks to the, the pollution in the Gulf of Mexico that um, it has hurt many of those birds. And here's a wood duck that is carved out of a log and parts of the log are still uh, there. Uh, the bird is emerging out of the log. In the same room are a few other sculptures by Chris Wilson that are an homage to some of the North American birds that are now extinct, such as the Carolina parakeet and the passenger pigeon. Then you move into the, the alcove outside of the main gallery space. We have a couple more um, carvings by Chris Wilson that speak to Georgia birds that are currently in distress, such as the bobwhite quail, the Eastern meadowlark, the oven bird, the Georgia state bird, the brown thrasher, the rose-breasted grosbeak, prairie warbler. And here on the left, we have a bluebird, which is doing, it was in decline, but due to human intervention is now recovering. And then a barn swallow on the right, which is in steep decline. Then moving from the alcove, you walk into the main gallery space of the Hudgens, which is a beautiful open space. And we've got the work of several artists in this part of the gallery. Here's another view. You'll see if you do go, I, I do encourage you to go to the Hudgens. It, it's a safe place to go. There's, 
um, there's only so many um, people they allow into each gallery at one time. Masking is required. And as you can see, you can spread out. We even had a group of young urban explorers or ecologists come one, one day for a tour. And when you, when you get into the space, one of the things you first notice is this amazing wall um, of uh, work by Kate Greeke, who is here with us today. Um, there's this elliptical montage um, on one part of the wall. And this is a, a, a representation of birds that have been killed by human contact of some sort. They're, they're photograms, which are images made Without a camera, the subject is simply laid on light sensitive paper and exposed to light. And they, these images become ghostly shadows of the remains of these living creatures burned in the photographic paper with light and with love to make a lasting impression, the only document of their brief existence here on earth. And you can see all the different types of birds um, that, that Kate photographed with these photograms. Graham method. And to the right of this ellipse is a grid pattern of, of birds. And these are birds that were killed by window strikes where they hit buildings with windows. Uh, many of the birds in this, in this series are birds from Atlanta. And Georgia Audubon has a program where they collect a lot of the birds that hit Atlanta skyscrapers many during migration. And for educational purposes, they keep the birds and they, we were able for the educational purposes to, to ship them out to Cape Breaky. So they, she could then turn them into these beautiful hand-colored photographs. And she'll talk more about this in a little bit. And then from Cape Breaky's work, you turn and you see this wonderful wall of, it's a sculptural wall of birds coming out of the space. And th this is a particular piece by Chris Condon, who is also here with us today. And he'll talk about it more in detail, but I'll go over it briefly. Um, we've got a couple of different pieces by Chris. This one is called Flyway, which explores the beauty, wonder, and fragility of the Atlantic Flyway, the major migratory route of birds here on the East Coast. And this flock is reminiscent of the spring migration path of the birds as they head up the East Coast. And one, one thing I really love about this piece are the dramatic shadows that the birds create um, because they're, they're, they're um, mounted away from the wall. This piece is called Fish Eaters, and it's a celebration of the comeback of the brown pelican. Now, the brown pelican numbers were in great distress, but because of legislative and human help, they are now in, in great numbers. And then this piece is called Grasslands. It's about the plight of the eastern meadowlark. And Chris will tell you much more about this, but it also it talks about the beauty of these birds, but also of their demise and the grassland demise. So turning from Chris's piece, you, you'll notice on one of the far walls this beautiful monumental oil painting. And at first it looks like an abstract, but it actually is, there is more to it than it just being an abstract. It's not quite what you think it is. It's a painting by an artist out of Pennsylvania. Her name is Patricia Griffin, and she's going to talk about it more here. Movement and environment are very important to me in the work. Um, this piece is part of a migration series, which the piece in uh, Three Billion is as well. And um, I am a major conservationist and have always used my work as a little bit of a microphone to talk about the, um, the need for space for migrating animals because they, you know, need more, uh, they need a global space. Talking about migration, why don't you tell us a bit about the piece that you have in the Three Billion show? That piece is uh, snow geese migration. And um, in the 
February of 19, or 19, oh my God, 2020, 19, I wish it was 19. Uh, they came through a place in uh, Western PA, Lancaster County called Middle Creek. And this was property that was put aside um, in the 30s, I believe, um, to protect farmland for the geese to migrate through. And last year there were 125,000 geese. Well, it, it, I wanted it to be like, no way, that's impossible, because that's really what it felt like when it was happening. I mean, in the videos that I had taken, my husband was with, and he was doing video, and I was still shooting. Um, and if you can hear me, just, you know, screaming, like, oh, my God, I can't believe it. Uh, but when they lifted off, you actually felt this wind, you know, and there was nothing specific that you saw at that moment, but you felt like you were part of something so monumental. So turning from Patricia Griffin's piece, you'll notice in the middle of the main gallery space, this wonderful luminescent nest-like structure hanging from the middle of the ceiling. Now this piece was created by an artist out of Hawaii, um, Brittany Wyland, who lives on the North Shore of Oahu. And the piece was made out of discarded surfboard making parts. And Brittany is here by video to talk a little bit more about this piece. Originally, I kind of wondered if I was going to need to um, like construct it, kind of wiring it together as I went, and then maybe put resin over the whole thing. But as I went, I was actually taking away all of the things that supported it. And as I was going, I realized this you know, if I tied my hands together and used my mouth, maybe that would end up being more like a bird's experience. I'm watching videos of them weaving together these nests and it's so much effort and so intricate, but um, it starts out so loose and delicate and ends up being this um, structure. And I, I, I didn't crawl in it, but I tried to make it the size that I could picture myself actually um, being in it. One of the things that I was really interested in um, when making the nest is the idea that it's scavenged from materials um, that are around you, that it's a sort of impermanent structure, um, but it's constantly being constructed from what came before it. Um, there's this reflection and projection consistently um, moving forwards. And I guess as a message that it's sort of conveying is urging the viewer to consider the nests that they are um, that have been constructed for them, that they are constructing. We're constantly building these nests and what they are actually nurturing um, and considering the sort of um, complex ways that they're built, um, that ideas don't just appear out of nowhere, is that they, they are scavenged from around and not just on an ideological level, but physically, the nests that we are um, building and for the next generation, what we're leaving, materials we're leaving them um, to work with. And the plastic not only speaks to um, the excess in plastic in the surfboard building industry, um, which is pretty rampant, but as society as a whole, um, that it's, it's unsustainable, essentially, that, that sort of word that's kind of become a little bit trendy, it, just, it means it can't continue. So turning from Brittany's nest, um, another wall is a work of two artists. On the left is Pam Longabardi's work, and on the right is a Virginia artist named Eileen Gowdy. Two quilts by Eileen. And the first quilt is called Which Side Are You On? And this is a quilt that Eileen created for mm -hmm. children. And you'll see uh, on the left side of the quilt, there is a yard with a free roaming cat and some non-native species of plants and some plastic flamingos and there are not many birds on that side of the quilt but on the right side of the quilt are some water features and bird feeders and you see the cat is behind the window and the birds are much more numerous and are doing quite well and with these close-ups you can see all the wonderful little detail that she put in she wanted children to be able to look at the quilt and find something different every time mm -hmm. they looked at it. 
And then to the left is another quilt by Eileen Dowdy called Fast Forward. And one of the first things you uh, should look for in this quilt are the, the range of colors. And the colors on the left side of the quilt are these cool blues and greens. And moving towards the right side of the quilt, the colors become much more harsher and desolate. So this quilt is called Fast Forward. It speaks to worldwide increases in greenhouse gases, temperature, pollution, pesticide usage, deforestation, human population, and outdoor cat predation. The birds are subtle on the front until you look really closely. The background is quilted like a graph. Various ribbons and stitches indicate the decrease in birds caused by increases in environmental problems. A large bird flies across the front with his wings position changing. Only a few birds remain on the right. And we hung the quilt away from the wall so that you can help see the birds by looking at the back black fabric. And then to the left of Eileen's quilts are two pieces by a local artist, an internationally recognized local artist named Pam Longabardi. On the left is a piece called Disappearance of Wings. And it is um, eight copper portraits of bird extinctions that have happened in the 1900s. They are paired with mounted coffin handles whose decorative qualities are distinctly avian. And here's a close up of two of the copper plates. On the left is an ivory billed woodpecker and on the right, a Guadalupe flicker. And they both have the dates of their extinction and their names etched below. And then to the right is a piece called Rainbows End in Paradise. And at first glance, this piece looks like a pretty rainbow of colors, but when you find out more about the piece, it's actually 490 plastic lighters that were found in albatross nests on Midway Island, an inaccessible atoll in the North Hawaiian Islands, which is the primary home to a, a million plus nesting lazen albatross. Now these lighters were lighters that the albatross picked up mistaking them for food out in the ocean. And they brought these lighters back regurgitated them to their chicks in the nests on Midway. And the chicks, unfortunately, would die from ingesting these lighters. So these are ghost objects that have a dismal afterlife in the non-human world. And it's pretty shocking the, the, the strange journey these, these lighters have made back to Atlanta. So from the main gallery space, there's, a, there, there's you walk into this beautiful arched, um, area, arched area with these skylights, and we've got the work of two different artists in this space. And here we have two sculptures by Athens-based artist Mary Engel. And Mary creates these beautiful sculptures of wildlife. In this case, we have an owl and a red-winged blackbird. And they're made out of objects that she found at flea markets and antique shops and just general trash as well. And she assembles them into this wonderful montage of um, birds that she's very familiar with around her home. The second piece is her red winged blackbird piece. And looking closely, you can see buttons and watch parts and compass parts. Turning from Mary's work, uh, we, we get to a, a few pieces by me. <laughs> I'll tell you more here. In this area of the building is some of my work that I created for the show. I'm not only the curator of the show, but I'm also an artist as well. And I work in paper. I don't use any paint. I create these heavily layered paper collages. And what I decided to do was to focus on different biomes of bird species that are in distress. Um, I did a pollinator piece, a wood warbler piece, a red-winged blackbird piece, a grassland bird, 
uh, chimney swifts and wetlands birds, uh, such as the wood storks. And in these pieces, I asked, asked the birds, well, if you had a choice in what kind of world you would like to live in, tell me and I'll create it for you. So I created these beautiful um, settings for the birds that are usually devoid of any uh, mention of human activity in them. So this first piece is the wood stork piece. Um, I use primarily papers from Japan, Japanese washi papers many different layers and to try to create this um, very light um, Asian influenced composition. This is um, a hummingbird piece called Pollinators. It's a hummingbird fantasy land where there's several different species of hummingbirds living in perfect harmony together in their perfect environment. This piece is um, a chimney swift piece. It's the only one with any mention of human presence in it. And it's a chimney that is actually my chimney here in Atlanta. My husband and I are host to thousands of chimney swifts in our chimney that come and visit us every summer. This is a red winged blackbird piece. The red winged blackbirds are in great decline, even though they're the most numerous birds in, um, in North America. They're calling out to their friends over the marsh. And this is a female red-winged blackbird, which looks very different than the males. So this piece is about the grassland biome. Um, it's a uh, bobolink and bobwhite. You zoom in and you see the little bobwhite quail down in the grasses on a nest. And the boba lynx, which are another member of the blackbird family that is in great distress. They're fluttering up above. And then there's a wood warbler piece. Our forest bird numbers are way down. And this is a peaceable kingdom of wood warblers. Uh, many of them I see when I'm up in Western North Carolina or Northern Georgia on hikes in the spring and the fall. So a show like this wouldn't be complete without a call for action. And Georgia Audubon, being the wonderful co-sponsor that they are, um, helped put together this exhibit called Bring Birds Back. And it's a rolling video of um, different things that um, explain what people, normal everyday people can do to help our declining bird population. Uh, one of the most important thing and easiest thing that all of us can do is to plant native species of plants in your yard to allow the birds to have more food and more shelter. And I think the second most important thing we can all do is to support conservation groups like Georgia Audubon. They've been an amazing co-sponsor and I can't say enough good things about them. So I'm gonna introduce both Kate Ricci and Chris Condon and then have them um, talk individually. Um, first, I just wanted to say a little bit about Kate. Um, she is an internationally acclaimed and collected artist known for her richly hand-colored photographs of birds, flowers, and animals. She's originally from Adelaide, Australia, uh, taught photography at the University of Texas. And she now lives in Tucson, Arizona. She's had five books published about her work. And in the last 40 years, once in a while, it has appeared in more than 120 one-person exhibitions and over 60 group exhibitions in the United States, France, Japan, mm -hmm. Australia, China, and New Zealand. And in Atlanta, I am so lucky that she shows several series of her works in my gallery down in Midtown, Brickworks Gallery. Um, and I'm also going to introduce Chris Condon, and then we'll, we'll move on to um, Kate's presentation. But Chris is an Atlanta-based sculptor, and whoops, let me change to his work. Um, and in his studio, he creates work for both public and private commissions. 
He's exhibited in group shows throughout the Southeast and created public commissions for the Atlanta Botanical Garden, the East Roswell Library, and the Georgia Botanical Gardens in Athens. And so now I'm gonna stop sharing my screen and we're gonna move on to um, Cape Riki's presentation. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Laura, for inviting me here today. And it was a great honor to be in this show at the Hudgens. Um, Hopefully I'm gonna be out there in a month to actually see the work in person. Um, I wanted to tell you a little bit more about myself and then I'll move on to telling you about the work. Um, I'll just share my screen, desktop, share, uh, play. Okay, um, I have been uh, an artist for a very long time, 40 years in fact, and um, all of my work to date has been about the natural world, which I find utterly fascinating and wonderful and sad, especially in this time of such devastating loss of species. Um, I'm a photographer, but I alter images. I uh, paint on them. I, 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 I used to print black and white images and then hand color them with oil paint. Um, I also use pastel and pencil and I do what is called alternative processes in photography, which includes the photograms that you're gonna see. Um, I'm interested in blurring the lines between photography and painting and drawing. I love that it makes an image more unique and more subjective and, um, and more personal. And I, I love the sensual nature of, of working with pigment, with paint. I trained as a painter printmaker from way back in art school before I moved on to photography. Um, my love of birds goes way back. Um, I grew up in Australia, down here on the tip of Air Peninsula next to the Southern Ocean where there was lots and lots of bird life in a small country town. Um, and I had a family who were rescue people. This is on the beach photographing a dead crow. Uh, had a family of, of rescuers uh, that I grew up with. Here is my aunt with a possum that was a a rescue possum and they also had lots and lots of birds including magpies and so going to their house was kind of amazing this menagerie of creatures including um, uh, a wombat that would always um, try and bowl you down and magpies that would attack you because they're very territorial um, so um, you know the wildlife thing as I said goes way back my father collected uh, not collected I mean he, he bred Gouldian finches he was a bird enthusiast uh, we had kookaburras that nested in the eaves of the house when I grew up. Very, very colorful parrots and cockatoos, lots of ducks and chickens. And this was all hugely uh, influential. Grew up with all these reference books, um, learned really to, to kind of be interested in, and respectful of nature. So moving on, um, as an adult um, out of art school, I started making these human scale head and shoulders portraits of dead birds and hand coloring them, as I said, starting with a black and white image and putting paint on. Um, and I did this for a very long time. Um, and uh, I'll just read you this bit that I wrote for the introduction. When the trembling heart stops beating, what remains is a tiny, beautiful corpse. I make a portrait to commemorate that life, to express my sorrow and regret, and as a gesture towards all the little creatures whose lives and deaths happen around us without notice. I make these portraits larger than life, my size, so that we're on equal ground, so that we can meet each other eye to eye and I can get to know them, every feather recorded and preserve and display along, long after their bodies are gone. I'll just go through these. So I've been doing them, I was doing these in, when I lived in, in Texas and then I moved out to Arizona and of course there were completely different birds out here. Um, so I, I did this for a very long time and it culminated in, um, in a book called Small Deaths. Um, so the work that is in the Hudgens uh, are these 65 four birds on a wall that was part of a larger series of photograms of animals and plants um, that I called Las Sombras, the shadows. And um, they ranged I've shown them in, in many different places in, in many different ways, mostly like this uh, where they're, they're um, uh, salon style on, and they're everything from scorpions and beetles, bats, mice, large mammals, coyotes, deer, uh, snakes, birds, possums, rabbits, any, anything that is given to me dead or I find dead. 
And as I said, I've shown them various places and times over the years. Um, I think there's more than 200 in the, in the series. So um, Laura mentioned that these photograms are made without a camera. The subject, and in this case, it's a jackrabbit, um, is simply laid down on light sensitive paper and exposed to light. And what you get is this negative uh, shadow image that shows the variation in tone that depends on the transparency of the of the actual subject. And of course, birds have, you know, semi-transparent, translucent wings, so it works very beautifully, the modeling of them. Uh, they look three-dimensional, even though they're just a piece of photographic paper. Uh, this is the earliest uh, form of photography uh, that was invented by Henry Fox Talbot, who's considered the father of photography. Um, and they're called photogramic, photogenic drawings or photograms. Um, and as Laura said, you know, these were all just these ghostly shadows of, of creatures that documented their brief existence. Um, this also culminated in a, in a book published by University of Texas Press. Uh, and of course they are, because they're uh, what are called a contact print, they are the size of the real creature. They're a shadow of a real creature. So when Laura asked me to be in this show, I got out all the photographs that I had of birds and I arranged them um, to fit on the, the space, the wall. And uh, because I couldn't come out to hang this show myself, um, I ended up making kind of this scale model of the whole thing um, the 20 some foot wall and numbered them all and then packed them with numbers on them so that the person who hung them actually could just do it fairly simply. Um, it's still rather a big task. Uh, the other work are these individual images of dead birds that um, as Laura mentioned had flown into windows and some of these were sent to me by the Georgia Audubon um, with that they had collected as she said. I was uh, first inspired uh, by these beautiful drawings from the 18th century um, before photography, when all science had to be drawn. Um, sorry, this is still the, the birds, the way they were sent to me with the little piece of paper that identifies uh, where they were found and on what date and what they are. Um, uh, so this French biologist who was an illustrator, Charles Lassure, made these beautiful drawings of jellyfish. And I loved the fact that they were in the middle of this big white creamy space that was the page he drew on that of course are now aged and uh, foxed. And I kind of wanted to do this with the birds um, to make them feel much more like drawings and, and to give them sort of a vintage feel. So this is all possible now to do in the computer. So what I did was I would photograph a bird just down on a copy stand like this is a, a mockingbird, northern mockingbird. And um, again, this is just down on, on a, the copy stand that I have. And then I would, in the computer, actually put in uh, textures that were reminiscent of this aging paper and then write down the genus species in the bottom corner so they had somewhat of a museum-y scientist feel. So I've been doing this for some time. Um, and then when, um, when I had the discussion with Laura about this, we decided this would be a good thing to do for this show. Um, and also include um, the, um, some of the Georgian common birds I don't know whether you have white crown sparrow. Um, and this is a black throated gray warbler, Pyroloxia. This is one of yours, white warbler, black and white warbler. This is one of ours, Northern Flicker. Yours, blue headed Vireo. Oh, I think that's it. Okay, so um, again, this is just a memorial to all these um, little creatures who, I think that's the end of that, yeah. I'll stop sharing my screen now, if I can. Why can't I shop, stop sharing my screen? We are, stop sharing, okay. So uh, yeah, this is, you know, what I do. I, I make memorials, tributes to, to dead creatures, but in particular, birds. I've been a bird of my whole life and as I said it's been a great honour to be in this show along with some incredibly talented um, other artists um, whose work I absolutely love including Chris Condens who's here to speak to you next. That's it for me. Awesome. Well thanks Kate. I'm going to share my screen now.
Well, hello. Um, as everybody's introduced me, my name is Chris Condon, and I'm a sculptor. I'm originally from New England, but I've been here in Atlanta working for about 25 years. When I first moved to Atlanta after art school, I was primarily carving stone, creating pieces for both private and public gardens. Most notably was the Green Man I was commissioned for by the Botanical Gardens here in Atlanta. After years of working in the stone, I really began to shift my interest and I found wood. And then I started experimenting with combining the wood and stone and using, creating these large blocks that I laminated together and then I would then carve into sculptures. And this opened up a whole new way of working for me and a new style emerged. I began making work inspired by the natural world around me and continued to experiment with materials and process in my studio. From birds to mammals to insect architecture, I strive to make work that is aesthetic and engaging. Ultimately, I want to ignite viewers' interest and make them more aware of our natural surroundings, hopefully leading to a compassion and stewardship for our environment. Sometimes I really investigate form and shape. Sometimes I create more playful narratives. I sometimes make work still for the outdoors and public spaces. But I most often make pieces for the wall, usually groups of birds. And this piece is called um, 12 Songbirds. It's a piece I did for a show in 2012 at the Baskerman Highlands, North Carolina. It was a group show and Laura was also one of the artists showing in that show. And I was flattered that she remembered me from all these years and asked me to be part of her show, The Three Billion. My work always starts out with research. And after reading The Three Billion article, I became very interested in the Atlantic Flyway. The Atlantic Flyway, as Laura mentioned earlier, is a north-south migratory route of over 500 birds 500 species of birds here in North America. And it runs up and down the East Coast. It begins in Mexico and Central America where the birds spend their winter and goes north following the Appalachian Mountains and Eastern Seaboard up into New England and points north. I realized I wanted to do a piece about the flyway, especially since it passed right through Georgia and is used by so many of the birds I'm familiar with. I began to focus on three birds for this piece that are threatened, the golden wing wobbler, the wood thrush, and the cerulean blue wobbler. The major threats of these birds along the route are window strikes, loss of habitat, pollution, and being preyed upon by feral outdoor cats. As I learned more about the flyway, I became really interested in the particular flight patterns of these birds, as well as the overall route the flyway takes. With this in mind, I began to draw a lot to work out my ideas. These are some of my drawings early in my sketchbook, playing with lines and flow and shapes. And I settled on the piece being a flock, a flock made up of these three species, all flying together. They're devoid of usual colors and are simple shapes of black and white, the way we usually see bird flocks passing overhead, often fast and too hard to identify. On the ground lay six dead migrators, reminding us of the challenges these birds face. They're all mounted off the wall at different depths, creating lots of shadows, giving the sense of a much larger flock. And the overall shape of the flock mimics the spring migration route of the flyway. And in the studio, in the process of making this work, I knew I really wanted to focus on the individual birds and their flight patterns and their wing movements. To achieve this, I carved the wooden bodies and wings separate and attached them, allowing me to really play with the gesture I wanted. And then to achieve the color and the weathered surface, I first started with a thick undercoating of enamel paint and painted all the birds as you can see here. After this dries, add a custom mixture of tar, sand, Georgia soil and burn it as it dries. The twigs here on the right are ones I used for the feet that I collected and dipped in the same tar solution. Here's a little video of me burning them.
I really like what happens in that process. You have these things I create that are really delicate and precious and then just allowing things to happen like burning and tar. I really am into that. And I really think that's how a lot of things you find in nature are. So I'd like to really mimic that when I can. And then after figuring out I had this flock, how I was going to position them and then also position them for the gallery, I made, created this giant paper template here in the studio. And I figured out the layout of the birds first and then numbered them all and had corresponding numbers on the template that the installer was able to use and it hung greatly. In the, uh, the second piece I made for the show is entitled Grasslands. And this piece started out with a pitchfork I found while hiking along a river in Vermont. I often collect things on my hikes from great shaped branches to rocks, from found objects to bones. I call them my souvenirs and organize them in my studio for future use in my work. The pitchfork is so symbolic of farming, it led me to research birds that inhabit grassy farmlands and I landed on the meadowlark. This threatened bird is an annual visitor of Vermont where it nests in grassy habitats. The meadowlark is threatened by habitat loss as well as the use of pesticides in farming. I wanted to explore these challenges, so I started drawing. The narrative I ended up creating shows five dead birds on the ground, representing the meadowlark's population decline in recent years. The two meadowlarks perched on the pitchfork are at a loss. The younger looks to the elder for guidance, but he simply looks down, unsure of what lays ahead. This piece evolved quite a bit as I was really trying to get the position and the gesture right of the birds. I created the birds the same way I did in Flyway, creating their parts separate then assembling them. For the finish, I used the same type of tar solution, but I added color to show off the signature yellow of the metal arcs. And the third piece I did for the show, I really wanted to have a bit of optimism for this piece. And it was a way to pay homage to a bird I love and see when I'm on the Georgia and South Carolina coast. I didn't grow up seeing pelicans. So when I first saw them in the low country years ago, I was immediately intrigued and began to draw and photograph them. Fish Eaters celebrates the comeback of the brown pelican. Pelican numbers began plummeting in the early 20th century when fishermen slaughtered pelicans, believing they were decimating their fisheries. The use of DDT in the 40s added to this decline. But thanks to the introduction of the Endangered Species Act, as well as the banning the use of DDT in the 70s, their population has now recovered. And like most of my work in the studio, I really like to both construct and carve my pieces. And I, this causes me to really break down the subjects into simple sharp parts and shapes, as you can see here. And I really love to experiment with materials, especially a lot of natural materials. So for the pelican's pouches, I actually use corn husks that I dyed and shaped while wet. So the outcome of the brown pelican gives me hope that we can make changes to the detriment we have already caused to so many birds. I do hope the artwork in this show can spark others to get involved and make a difference and help with the plight of so many of our birds. Well, I just want to say thank you guys all so much for, you know, being a part of the show and especially thank you to you, Laura, for, you know, curating this really special and spectacular exhibit. Um, we've already had so many people come through and just it's gotten such high praise from all of our visitors. Uh, and each Laura, you did a really good job finding different artists because everyone brought something, a t just a really interesting perspective. You know, there's, I look at the show every day and there's, there's still, I, I'll stop and investigate a little bit more. Um, and uh, is there any, uh, before we wrap up, I also wanted to ask if there was, 
uh, anywhere people could go donate um, if they're really interested in this cause or how they could get involved? Um, well, they, they, we have information at the show, um, but you can also go online and um, find out more about um, declining bird populations and what you can do from Georgia Audubon. Um, that this is their mission um, to help um, birds and people thrive together. Um, so if you do want to find out more about things that you can do, I recommend you um, join the, the group. They're, they're a wonderful, fun group of people. They have a lot of, um, do a lot of outings where you can go watch birds and learn more about them. They also do a lot of online programming that talk about um, the plight of the birds and different solutions. It either it, Georgia Audubon is my favorite, but there are other organizations too, but um, people should just get involved with a conservation group. All right, guys, I think we're gonna uh, wrap it up there, but for anyone who wants to come see the show or is able to come see the show in person, um, it's going to be up through April 24th. Uh, the Hudgens is open. Tuesday through Saturday. Uh, Tuesday through Friday, we're open till five. Saturdays, we're open till four. Um, but it's it's definitely a show that's, that's worth it, the drive if, it, if it's possible for you. I, I'd recommend it. Although I guess I'm a little biased. I do work at the Hudgens. All right, thank you guys so much. We're gonna wrap up. Um, have a great day. Let's, thank you very let's much. Bring the birds back. Thank you. Yes. Okay. <laughs>